welcome back to the uh, LA 206 uh, thesis presentations, uh, the LAP thesis presentations for this year. Uh, I'm Danny Rogeri and I'm taking over from Luis Mozingo for a moment. We could talk this class and we are going to, I'm welcoming uh, John Racky, uh, Rob Reby from the University of Oregon as a reviewer, Athena Dimitri, who she was um, involved in uh, Adam's uh, committee. John Racky is the chair of that committee. And I think, no, I'm, or is I'm, it Irina? Irina is the chair, yeah. Sorry about that. Irina is the chair, and then John was the the, uh, the other committee member. So yeah, welcome everybody. And if there's uh, and um, Adam, take it off. Great. Sure. Great. Welcome back, and thank you everyone for being here. I will jump right into it. <clears throat> So my name is Adam Dickinson, and uh, my project is the X, Y, and Z a Vegetation in a Constructed Wetland. <clears throat> uh, vertical stratification patterns by horizontal attributes of wetland patches. So my research is exploring the characteristics of vertical vegetation structure throughout a constructed wetland and examines if vertical vegetation structure is correlated to horizontal vegetation structure. So <clears throat> why does this matter? <clears throat> well and vertical structure impacts uh, wildlife utilization, susceptibility to predation, and food source availability. Um, vertical structure also contributes directly to light attenuation or how much light is penetrating the canopy. Um, this impacts wildlife as well as plant life from fish habitat to plant growth to end species presence. Having a better understanding of vertical vegetation structure, the impacts it may have on wildlife utilization <clears throat> and light attenuation, and the changes in vertical structure over time will inform resource management planning and site design. And finally, uh, it's not good enough anymore to have uh, one benefit solutions. Gavin Newsom's recent executive order mandates multi-benefit cooperative approaches to um, <clears throat> protect and restore biodiversity while at the same time building climate resilience. So we need to create multi-benefit solutions. So we already know that the vertical structure of vegetation in wetlands is very important. Uh, we know it impacts light attenuation, microbial activity, carbon storage, nutrient cycling, plant biodiversity, landscape heterogeneity, and wildlife utilization. What we don't know is what is contributing to the makeup of that vertical structure. We don't know how the vertical structure is configured horizontally, and we don't know the aging process <clears throat> of the vertical structure in wetlands. Understanding the maturation process is one of the most limiting factors in wetland restoration. So while infield monitoring is very important, it has a very narrow spatial scope. But by utilizing remote sensing, we can expand the spatial scope of wetland monitoring, allowing us to situate our current knowledge within the <clears throat> broader landscape context. So my research question is composed of four specific questions. Is uh, vegetation maximum height correlated to distance to water? Is vegetation height correlated to patch size? Is vegetation uh, stratification of the subcanopy correlated to distance to water? And is vegetation stratification correlated to patch size? So this leads to the following hypotheses. As patches grow and decompose, this is going to affect light limitations, and there's going to be a cyclical pattern of tall vegetation and litter, and litter development as patches age and expand horizontally outward. Uh, buildup of litter in the patch interior would create different light availability than at the patch edge, <clears throat> and vegetation nearest the water will be taller compared to inland. And lastly, uh, large patches will be more heterogeneous and, stru and structurally complex than smaller patches. Uh, this is visualized in this graphic where vegetation at the patch edge of a younger patch uh, is very tall and lush, whereas vegetation in the interior of an older established patch is much less productive um, and the buildup of litter is starving vegetation of light availability. So let's take a look at where I carried out my research. Mayberry Farms is a constructed wetland in Sherman Island in the California Delta. <clears throat> it's dominated by tall wetland species, cattail and tule, 
uh, with vegetation growing up to three meters tall. Sherman Island is a man-made island. Uh, reclamation began in 1869 for agriculture due to its uh, rich wetland soils. And it's been the site of several floods as a result of a levee failure. Uh, currently, it's up to 25 feet below sea level. This is due to drainage of wetlands, resulting in land subside, um, subsidence. So as a result of land subsidence and climate change, the Mayberry Farms wetland was constructed specifically as a land subsidence and carbon capture project. Uh, the site is important because it's part of the Delta subsidence reversal project, which is becoming a new model for restoration in the Delta. <clears throat> But we don't completely understand how well in vegetation ages and vegetation impacts all of the targeted benefits within this project being biodiversity, soil accretion, greenhouse gas emissions and um, <clears throat> habitat availability. So how I carried out my research. I had only two data inputs, but I had two great data inputs. Uh, the first was four band aerial imagery at 15 centimeter resolution. And the second was LIDAR data at 21 points per square meter. The LIDAR points are representative of either ground or vegetation. And LIDAR is what I'm gonna be using to analyze the vegetation height and structure. So <clears throat> from the LIDAR, I created a DEM or a ground surface and other elevational models in ArcMap. And I used eCognition, which is a remote sensing software to delineate ve uh, vegetation patches versus areas of water. And just to note, um, remote sensing uses the physical properties of a light and object reflectance to classify land cover remotely. Um, this is great because I was never able to uh, visit the site. So I mapped the horizontal X and Y coordinates of the LIDAR returns in ArcMap. And then I extracted the Z value or the elevational value of each LIDAR point. <clears throat> So vegetation height then equals the elevation of elevation minus the elevation of the ground. The difference is vegetation height. Then in arc map, I calculated the minimum distance to water for each vegetation point. The result was vegetation height and distance to water for each data point, as well as the size of the patch that the veg <clears throat> sorry, vegetation was within. So once I processed the vegetation height data, I had to analyze it. Um, this was a huge data set. It's 11 million data points representing uh, the vegetation structure of the site. So although it was very large um, and computationally intensive, I decided to run my analysis on a point-based approach because this was ultimately more accurate. There was more possibility for anal um, analysis and it's more fluid if you wanna change your analysis approach. So. On the left here is a little glimpse into my code. Uh, please, I don't recommend trying to read this, uh, but this is how I analyze my data in R. I group the data points by patch size, and I analyze the vegetation data by different patch size ranges, because one of the things I'm interested in is if patch size contributes to differences in vegetation structure. And one of the things that I'm trying to approximate is light extinction or in other words, how quickly light is lost as you move down the vertical uh, vegetation profile due to vegetation structure. So to do this, I grouped my data points by half meter uh, vertical bins to represent the uh, different vertical stratifications of the patches. And this basically is recreating the densities of vegetation at different vertical profiles. And this quantifies the vertical structure, which regulates light extinction. So once I had the densities of the vertical stratifications, I fit an exponential curve to the data and I extracted the slope coefficient. This is from the Beer-Lambert law. It's a mathematical model, but it's a measure of light extinction. <clears throat> so my results. Um, is vegetation height correlated to distance to water? So here I'm looking at only the maximum vegetation height. Closer to water, vegetation is taller. And as you move inland, the vegetation height generally declines. Also notable, extremely tall vegetation is completely absent at greater distances to water. Is vegetation height correlated to patch size? 
So again, here I'm looking at only the maximum vegetation height, this time though grouped by patch size. So here we see that very tall vegetation is only present in the very largest patches and is completely absent from small to mid-sized patches. Smaller patches generally have shorter vegetation heights throughout the patch. And interestingly, uh, small patches also have shorter vegetation at the water's edge compared to vegetation at the water's edge of larger patches. Finally, looking at the uh, mid-sized patch in the middle, we see a strong and consistent decline in vegetation height with distance to water. Um, and what this may indicate is an inland buildup of litter uh, contributing to a decrease in plant productivity. So these inconsistencies among patch sizes indicate that vegetation height may be more strongly related to patch size rather than distance to water. Is vegetation stratification, so the subcanopy of the vegetation, correlated to patch size? So here I'm uh, looking at the high, uh, light decay coefficients and I plotted them by patch size. And from this we see that there is a smooth rise and then fall um, <clears throat> of the light decay coefficients with increasing patch size. And while this doesn't um, while this is less clear in larger patch sizes, this does indicate a shifting in, verti in vertical stratification with patch size among small to mid-sized patches. And finally, is vegetation stratification correlated to distance to water? So here, again, I'm plotting the light decay coefficients, uh, we and we see that there's a wide variety of light extinction rates in areas less than 10 meters to water. But we also see that this variety of light extinction rates is being driven by uh, small to mid-sized patches specifically. Large patches have a greater consistency in their light extinction rates. And, and while light extinction in larger patches is more consistent, it's not perfectly consistent. In other words, light decay coefficients in larger patches trend downward, but they do have these inland peaks of variation. <clears throat> so in conclusion, uh, one, we saw that patches of different sizes are not equivalent in their vertical structure, even at the same distances to water. We also saw that the largest patches have a lower level of light attenuation, likely due to the um, greater amount of litter buildup in larger patches. Both of these findings would suggest that patch size is a strong contributor to vertical structure. Two, patch size then, due to these differences in vertical structure, would impact the ecological processes and functioning of a wetland. This might affect rates of photosynthesis, carbon sequestration, wildlife utilization, biodiversity, and soil accretion. And finally, uh, what we're really studying here is wetland aging. Small patches are newly colonized areas or very young patches. Mid-sized patches represent a transitional phase as patches demonstrate a great degree of heterogeneity. The largest patches are areas of older vegetation and stabilized growth patterns. So by using patch size as a proxy for patch age, or what's called a space for time substitute, what we're really looking at are changes occurring in a wetland as it ages or the maturation process. Excellent. Irina, do you want to, you have a couple of minutes if you want to. Yeah. Uh, Just very, very briefly, thank you, Adam, for the presentation. I also wanted to talk a bit about the age and encourage you to talk about something else here is that, you know, my understanding of the role of age in your system was that it wasn't so much that we were trying to establish that relationship, but rather that, that that's what explains this variability across the landscape. And because we don't have LIDAR data collected every year, unlike we have some of the other imagery, that's kind of a way to use space for time to make that proxy. But the goal 
was not really to quantify how age influences, because in other wetlands, it could be very different. Like John said, there could be a very large patch established from the beginning. But could you very briefly tell us how that becomes interesting and relevant to restoration? Because these projects often have multiple goals. Like you said, some yeah. people want to have open water for waterfowl hunting. Some people want to have patches of dense vegetation that sequester carbon and rebuild the soil. Um, why, why is that, regardless of how specifically age influences that, what, what is the value of looking at this? How can restoration managers use that? Yeah, thank you for asking that because that was essentially my last slide, which uh, disappeared the significance after the conclusions. So the significance basically is, you know, what I found is smaller, younger patches are have this wide variability of heterogeneity of, of heterogene, uh, heterogeneity. And, you know, this could provide a lot of habitat niches and diversity for wildlife use. So the smaller, having smaller patches could provide, you know, the biodiversity within the site. But then the larger patches, they stabilize with their production and light attenuation and maybe lose some of that biodiversity, but they're kind of the workhorses of the carbon capture aspect of this site. So, the takeaway is if you if you incorporate and allow for both of these, and if you allow for smaller patches, which increase biodiversity, but also allow for the larger patches which, or maximize the production of the larger patches, this is gonna maximize the carbon storage. Um, and then this is really getting to, uh, you know, providing biodiversity while at the same time, you know, uh, affecting climate resilience this is the kind of multi-benefit solutions that we need to think about going forward. Thank you so much, Adam. This is a perfect, you know, this rich dialogue is a perfect example of what, you know, like a, a nice thesis does. So thank you so much for, uh, to you and to the viewers and we need to move on to the next uh, person. Um, the next presenter is Stephanie. Stephanie Wright. Yeah, 